We're reading from Matthew 14, page 15 in the Pew Bibles, and it's Matthew 14, 22 and 23. Then he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. This is the word of the Lord. It said 23 in the, in the bulletin. Yeah, I Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many furlongs distance from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat washed him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. I apologize for the uh, error there. I gave Anita the wrong verses, and that's what made it into the bulletin. Um, in my defense, I am distracted. And I am distracted because I have a nine-month-old son who, um, he's, yeah, William, William is now nine months old. He can crawl. He can say a couple of words badly. Um, he can stand up as long as he has something to hold on to, all of which is to say that it is now a full-time job to prevent him from killing himself. There's that stage in every human being's life where every, everyone else, their, their only effort is just to keep you from murdering yourself because there are a hundred ways you can do it. Now, the really, the, the, the challenging and the, the endearing and frustrating and horrifying thing about children, especially really young children, is that they don't know what cannot be done. Right, they don't have any limits. They don't have any safety shields. They don't have anything, nothing in their mind tells them that it would be a really bad idea to crawl over and yank all the dog's hair or something like that. Fortunately, our dog is smart enough to walk away. But uh, yeah, sure, right? Having climbed up the stairs head first, of course you can climb down the stairs head first. Why not? <laughs> um, do those scissors fit in the electrical outlet? Of course they do. <laughs> you know, right? Let's find out. That's that sort of stuff, right? You just don't know you can't do it at that age. One of the things that happens as we grow, as we gain experience, the world beats that out of us. The world beats it out of us. The world teaches you, spends the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years teaching you what you cannot do, right? Um, and some of them are really hard lessons. I mean, eventually you learn that that cat that ran away three weeks ago, yeah, she's probably not coming back. She's probably not coming back. Certain promises. You learn that certain people, it doesn't matter what they promise. You, they say they'll be back in an hour. No, they won't. Some of them are heartbreaking, like, you know, the promise that, oh, sure, I'll be there at your birthday. I promise I'll never do it again. Stuff like that. And you learn the hard way that those promises get broken. The world teaches us 
or tries to teach us over and over and over again. Some of them are sensible limits. The one about not sticking scissors in the outlet is a good one. I highly recommend that rule. But the world teaches us over and over and over again, right, that, that nobody cares. That people don't change. That forgiveness is always conditional. That hatred begets hatred. That the meek are doomed. That death is the end. That you have to get what you can while you can get it. To hell with anyone who stands in your way, very literally. No one can change water into wine, so the world tells us no one can rise from the dead and no one most certainly can walk on water. This is what the world spends decades teaching us. But what if the world's wrong? What if the world were wrong? What if the world were wrong not in general, but what if the world were wrong very specifically about one person? What if hard experience turns out to be an unreliable tutor in one very specific case, right? What if one person made a way that was unconditional? To forgiveness, right? What, for anyone, no matter what, death, death rules in this world, sure, but what if there were one person over whom death did not rule and who death could not hold? The dead stayed dead, but what if one man didn't? What if there were one man out of the billions who have lived who really could walk on water? Um, it's hard to fight a lifetime of conditioning. Right? This is why faith is difficult, because it really is asking you to believe stuff that the world has spent your entire life telling you cannot be. That's why it's a miracle. <laughs> faith itself. Um, it's hard to fight a lifetime of conditioning, so you have to have a little sympathy here for Jesus' disciples, don't you? I don't blame them a bit. They were out on this lake, right? It was late. Verse 25, Matthew says it was the fourth watch of the night. Now, that's a Roman reckoning, but that means between 3 and 6 a.m. So it's dark. It's the bare early hours of the morning. They've been out there since before sunset. So, I mean, I don't know. Seven, eight hours? And keep in mind that the Sea of Galilee is only about 15 miles wide at the widest. And you should be able to traverse the Sea of Galilee in in a small boat in maybe three hours, two, three hours, right? So they've been out there for eight hours, maybe more, struggling against the wind and the waves And uh, the other minor detail about the Sea of Galilee, because it's so relatively small um, and because it's relatively shallow, when storms kick up, they kick up huge waves. Same thing goes for Lake Erie, incidentally. Lake Erie is the most dangerous of all the Great Lakes in bad weather uh, because it's the shallowest. Funny enough, big bodies of water are safer in these things. But the Sea of Galilee is a small lake, shallow. When storms kick up, it's deadly. So they're out there for like eight hours. It's dark, it's early hours in the morning, and they see a man walking across the lake. And they respond the only way anybody would, which is to shout. Uh, Well, verse 26, Matthew says they were terrified, and they shouted, it's a ghost. There's some irony here, actually, when you get right down to it, because nobody ever questioned Jesus' reality when he was preaching on a hillside somewhere. Nobody ever said, oh, that guy's, you know, look at that, it's a ghost there. Nobody ever questioned Jesus' reality, called him mythical, when he was healing people in the streets and the alleys. But you let him walk on water, even his closest friends 
fail to recognize him. Um, we do the same thing, by the way. Um, <laughs> very often, we, I look, I, I assume that because you're here, you're at least okay with Jesus. I can't guarantee this, but I assume that because you're here, you're at least okay with Jesus. I'm going to assume, I'm, because I know you, that the vast majority of you are professing Christians. You're people who have said, yes, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I have given my life to him. I trust him for my forgiveness, for my salvation. He is my king, my lord, my savior. That's great. But you know what? Sometimes we treat him as if he's not real. We treat him like a ghost. And very often it's at the most impossible times when it looks least likely that he's able to help. We do the same thing. Um, Jesus answered immediately here. He said, take heart, it is I. Again, he has impeccable grammar. Very nice. <laughs> take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Not a ghost. Jesus. Suddenly, everything they thought, this is the, and this is a traumatic experience, and, and faith is a traumatic experience, because you discover instantly that everything you thought you knew was wrong. <laughs> That's part of coming to faith, is the discovery that all those old rules that you thought were hard and fast and unbreakable turn out, no, they don't apply. Not a ghost, Jesus, and um, doing yet again for about the 300th time what could not be done. And, and in that confusion, Peter spoke up and he said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Verse 28. Now, keep in mind, this is Peter, right? And Peter... I don't want this to sound like a criticism because, I mean, it's, he's, uh, it, it, I mean, he, he is the, the rock on which the church, Jesus said he would build his church, right? I don't want to knock him, but he did tend to say things just off the cuff. He tended to blurt out whatever he was thinking and sometimes whatever he was not thinking at the moment. And I, I think it's an open question whether he should have asked I don't know the answer to this. Um, John Calvin thought he was being rash. Peter was being rash when he asked Jesus, if it is you, command me to come and walk on the water. Calvin thought he was testing Jesus and should have just shut up and let Jesus come to the boat. I don't know. Um, John Chrysostom, John Chrysostom was the, the single greatest preacher of the early church. John Chrysostom uh, saw just the opposite. He saw Peter's request here as an act of faith. Right? Peter has such faith in Jesus that as long as he's sure that that is Jesus, he can walk on water too. I, I, I don't know. Doesn't really matter. Um, when we... <laughs> When we pray for a sign, is that a token of unbelief or, or of faith? Sometimes it's both. Maybe in Peter's case it was both. I, I don't know. But what happened next here is beyond dispute. What happened next is that Peter invited, or excuse me, Jesus invited Peter to step out of the boat to do the impossible, and Peter did it. He did it successfully right up to the moment that he looked down. That's, I mean, isn't that the general rule for like high wire acts and everything else? Never look down. Right up to the moment he looked down, he saw the water, and he thought, what the heck am I doing? And at that moment, the moment he stopped thinking about Jesus and started thinking about himself, he sank. Jesus, reaching out his hand here, grabbed Peter and he said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Everyone got back in the boat. Verse 33, it says, The wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Nice story, huh? Ends well. Everyone's happy. Everyone likes a happy ending. Um... 
There's still a few unanswered questions here, though, which, is, as it turns out, are really, really, really important. And, and the, the simplest one is, what's up with walking on water? I mean, you may not have noticed, but most of the time, Jesus used a boat when he wanted to cross a lake. Most of the time, he travels just like any, anyone else. It's not, this was not his accustomed manner of travel, jogging on the briny deep. Actually, it's a freshwater lake, so it's not the, but I like saying briny deep better than I do the water. <laughs> it's sl some slightly more poetic in an old salty seafaring way. I was at the beach last week, so I'm still harboring fantasies of uh, <laughs> serving as captain of a, I don't know, clipper to India or something. This was not his accustomed method of travel. Usually when Jesus went places, how did he go? He walked, right? <laughs> he just walked. Or he'd ride a donkey, or he'd go in a boat with his friend. You know, he, he, he traveled normally like a normal person. Why, on this case, walk on the water? Short answer, I don't know. But I do know it tells us something really, really important about who Jesus is. Right? And not who we, we think he is, not who we think he should be, not who he appears to be, but who he really is deep down. And the short answer is not just a teacher, right? Not just a rabbi, not just a good moral example. The person who can walk across that lake is the master of the wind and the waves. Why is he the master of the wind and the waves? Because he made them. They are his They are his. And that's a glorious thought. It's a glorious thought. Because as nasty as this world may look, as bad as the situation you find yourself in may be, you remember that the one who loves you the one who redeemed you the one who calls you to himself is the boss. <laughs> you have a friend in very, very high places. That's a good thing. Um, second thing just I, to ask here in, in verse 30 is, what exactly happened when, when Peter started sinking? Because that's weird, too. Not only is it weird that Jesus was walking on water and that Peter started walking on water, but it's even weirder, I think, that he stopped. And, I mean, the key here, I think, has to just be that Jesus, excuse me, Peter sank because he took his eyes off Jesus. I mean, it's as simple as that. Again, the world has spent however many years you have lived, and I'm not going to insult you by trying to guess your age here, because I learned that a long time. That's one of the things the world teaches you. Never, ever guess anyone's age. Women, don't guess their age. Men, if they're bald, you think they're older than they are. We're not. We're just bald. It's not my fault I'm gray. <laughs> When I was 25 years old, I was working in an office, and one of, the, one of the girls that worked with me, she came in, it was her 29th birthday. And I, in an attempt to compliment her, told her, wow, I thought you were, we were closer in age. You look great. She got really offended. She said, how old do you think I am? And it took me about two minutes to figure out, she thought I was old, and I said, how old do you think I am? She said, I don't know, 40? I was 25. I was just bald. That's all. I was in good shape. That was before I had kids. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you... I don't even remember why I was talking about baldness. doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is that, that, that the world has spent however many years teaching you all these rules about what cannot be done right? About what's impossible. 
And we, on, on the one hand, the glory of faith is the discovery that in Jesus Christ, all things are possible. Those rules don't apply. However, those old rules, that conditioning, that's hardwired into you, and you can fall right back into it very, very easily. Doubt is always lurking. I don't care who you are. Doubt is always lurking. And in the minute we take our eyes, not literally but metaphorically, the minute we, we, we stop fixing our affections and attentions and faith on the person of Jesus Christ and start looking at ourselves, we sink. The old rules apply all of a sudden. Um, You know, we, we, we start to think, yeah, you know what? Maybe forgiveness is impossible. Maybe broken promises are always broken, right? Maybe nothing really does change. Those thoughts, they come creeping back. That you're somehow doomed by a choice that you made long time ago. That dead men don't rise. That you can't walk on water. As long as we are fixed on Jesus we, and following where he leads us, as long as we are fixed on Jesus following where he leads us, the impossible is entirely likely to happen. When we focus on ourselves or on the world around us, we sink. It's as simple as that. Follow closely. Pay attention. Be aware that the world is constantly trying to distract you. Be aware that the devil is constantly trying to turn your attention away. Go where he leads. Do the impossible. Do the impossible through Christ who strengthens you. And pray that he's glorified in it. Amen.